Hello, I'm Lorelei Corcoran, professor and director of the Institute of Egyptian Art and Archaeology at the University of Memphis. Welcome to the e-version of the 15th annual William J. Murnane Memorial Lecture, a series that commemorates the work and life of our colleague, Bill Murnane, professor of history at the University of Memphis and renowned for his contributions to the history of ancient Egypt's New Kingdom, especially the Amarna period. This series highlights the research of distinguished scholars whose work complements that of Dr. Murnane's. This year, it is my pleasure to introduce a friend and colleague, Dr. W. Raymond Johnson, director of the University of Chicago's Epigraphic Survey in Luxor, Egypt, and research associate professor of the University of Chicago's Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations and the Oriental Institute who received his BA from Tulane University and his PhD in Egyptian archeology span from the University of Chicago for his dissertation on Tutankhamun's battle reliefs. After participating in excavations in the US, Iran, Egypt, and Tunisia, Ray joined the epigraphic survey in Luxor, Egypt in 1979 as epigraphic draftsman and was appointed director in 1997. His directorship establishing Chicago House as an inclusive and welcoming research center in Egypt. It was in the great colonnade hall of Luxor Temple, documenting the opit reliefs of Tutankhamun, that Dr. Johnson began a lifetime of dedication to recording and analyzing the art of the Amarna period. His discerning eye has enabled the joining of hundreds of disparate blocks as a part of the Luxor Temple Fragment Project he initiated, as well as the reuniting of fragments of Egyptian statuary, sometimes separated by continents. Please enjoy Dr. Ray Johnson's lecture, in which he will share with us his new insights and discoveries about a pharaoh who is well known but about whom we really know so little. Tutankhamun's Life, Death, and Afterlife. New evidence from Thebes. Thank you very much, Lorelei, and thank you for the invitation to give this 15th William J. Murnane Memorial Lecture. This is a special pleasure for me because I worked with Bill for many years in Luxor at Chicago House. In fact, he was senior epigrapher of the epigraphic survey when I joined the team in the late 70s. So I have very fond memories of learning the craft and the science of epigraphic recording with Bill, with Bill during those early years. And it's a great pleasure to dedicate this lecture to him now. And of course, this is a topic very near and dear to Bill, Tutankhamun's life, death, and afterlife, especially in light of some interesting new material that's emerging from Thebes. Thebes, ancient Waset, modern Luxor, lies 400 miles south of Cairo, ancient Memphis, and of course was the seat of the great sun god creator god, Amun-Ra. Amun had a number of different temple complexes in Luxor on both sides of the river. The largest was Karnak on the east that was linked with Luxor Temple in the southern area here by a, a alleyway of sphinxes about three kilometers long. Luxor Temple was considered to be the place where Amun-Ra Amun was born and all of creation with him. Karnak is where he resided most of the year, but because the Egyptians believed that time was a circle, endlessly repeating, Amun of Karnak was obliged once a year during the great festival of Opet to travel back to Luxor Temple to be reborn and rejuvenated, after which he returned to Karnak. Luxor Temple itself is the product of primarily two kings, Amenhotep III, who constructed the uh, back part of the temple complex 
the earliest sanctuary, a solar court and columned hall, and Ramses II, who constructed another court fronted by pylons that may have been planned by his father, Seti I, but Ramses II actually did the work. And then you had the Nectanebo Sphinxes, Sphinx Way added much later. We are enormously fortunate that Luxor Temple is one of the best preserved monuments in all, from all of antiquity. And it's ironic and miraculous because, of course, Luxor Temple is still the center of Luxor town and always was. But instead of taking the ancient monuments down and using the building stone for new construction, um, the inhabitants of medieval Luxor simply adapted the ancient structures for reuse. Now, interestingly, the first court that we're seeing here from the south looking north continued to function as a place of worship. And in the Middle Ages, a church was constructed within a monastery and churches outside. And then later, a mosque was built uh, on top of the ruins of one of the churches, which is still a functioning mosque today. So we have a situation where the temple is still a place of worship after 4,000 years, which is pretty amazing. The back of Luxor Temple, the sanctuary area, was the first increment of the temple that was built by Amenhotep III, who replaced an earlier temple from the time of Hatshepsut, who had in turn replaced an earlier temple from the Middle Kingdom. And originally, in the time of Amenhotep III, this was the front of the temple. Later in his reign, he added a solar court. And then even later, in a massive third phase construction, he added a great column tall, papyrus columns, uh, 70 feet tall, uh, uh, capped with open papyrus umbels. This is one of the largest freestanding structures from antiquity, and it's still a wonder today. It's a miracle that it is still standing. <clears throat> Amenhotep III started the construction of the hall, but died before it could be finished, and the decoration was largely finished by Tutankhamun. But he, even he died before it be, could be completely done. He, Tutankhamun had a lot on his plate, and uh, his workmen were able to finish the construction of the hall and most of the decoration inside, but the decoration uh, at the very back of the hall was finished in paint because it, there wasn't time enough to carve it, apparently, before the coronation of Tutankhamun's successor, I, and then Horemheb later appropriated all the cartouches of Tutankhamun and I and reinscribed them for himself. So a rich history. And uh, the epigraphic survey, Chicago, based at Chicago House, has been working there since the mid-70s. Uh, and we have produced two volumes of all the reliefs and inscriptions from this time inside and outside of the Colonnade Hall from the time of Tutankhamun and his successors. In fact, actually a little bit of Amenhotep III there as well, who actually started the decoration of the hall, uh, but was, no, was just barely, barely starting it. And this image that, that we're seeing right now is one of the most beautiful images from the time of Tutankhamun from very late in his reign, clearly, because uh, the, the reliefs were unfinished at his death. And his cartouches have been modified. His name has been erased and um, Horemheb's name has been inserted, but traces of Tutankhamun's name within the cartouches make it very clear that this, this monument was largely carved by him. The reliefs that survive from the first register are absolutely extraordinary. Uh, they are referred to as the Opet reliefs because they describe the religious procession from Karnak to Luxor and back again for the reju rejuvenation rites of Amun and the king uh, during the, the great festival of Opet every year. And in this case, the procession took place not along the Sphinx Road, but was a water procession that uh, involved enormous divine barges of the gods and the king. And the reliefs are 
badly preserved, but what survives are really exquisite because Tutankhamun, of course, is executing these this decoration at a crossroads of Egyptian art, the very end of the Amarna period where Akhenaten had instituted some extremely interesting uh, artistic reforms, but Tutankhamun is getting back to the more traditional. So this, his reliefs are very much a crossroads. And I, I w participated in the drawing of this material when I first joined the team. Uh, I worked as an artist and there is nothing more wonderful than working with material like this and getting into the mind of the ancient artists of the time. So, as I mentioned, in this particular case, the, the procession from Karnak to Luxor and back again was by water. And while quite a bit of the walls are destroyed, there's enough that survives that shows the, the divine barges of the gods and the king were extraordinarily elaborate. And what survives, of course, is, is uh, only the carved outlines, the painted the painted details have washed away a long time ago. But as you can see, it's still pretty busy, just the carving. So the first register um, documented the water procession of Amun, Amun's wife Mut, and their son, the moon god Kansu, to Luxor Temple from Karnak and back again at the occasion of the Opet Festival. And because it's a crossroads, of Egyptian art because you have in, incredible innovations combined with the more traditional representations. There's an energy and an experimentation here that you, that you rarely find in Egyptian monuments. Instead of cookie cutter figures like you have from the Thutmosid period, um, pulling the tow ropes of, of the, the divine barges in the river procession. You have so many townspeople and soldiers here. There's absolutely no negative space whatsoever. It's fantastic. There's nothing like this in Egyptian art, except perhaps from uh, some of the structures of, of Akhenaten at Karnak and at Amarna. But then you've got traditional scenes as well. When the procession arrives at Luxor Temple, it's met by, um, priestesses shaking the sacred rattles of Hathor, the great Sistra. You have acrobatic dancers who are doing backbends um, that are absolutely the same as released from the time of Hatshepsut that document exactly the same opet uh, procession. This time, in the time of Hatshepsut, the uh, procession took place on the Sphinx Road, but it was greeted with similar uh, dancers and acrobats and priestesses when the, uh, the, the procession arrived at Luxor Temple. So these, these reliefs from the time of Tutankhamun are wonderful for this, this amazing combination of innovation and tradition in the iconography and the style. These butchering scenes um, that greeted the procession from uh, Karnak are absolutely identical to similar scenes from the time of Akhenaten, but these are all in raised relief as opposed to Akhenaten's sunk relief. Uh, but uh, ex extremely interesting how the, the, the scenes are absolutely identical to what Akhenaten was doing. And then you've got dancers, musicians greeting the procession uh, as it arrives at Luxor Temple or, or as it departs Luxor and, and uh, proceeds to Karnak. These Nubian dancers on the left are absolutely extraordinary for the, the dynamism, the, the, the energy of the dancing. If you look at their bent legs and the swaying tails of the animal skins that they're wearing, you can actually, they're actually moving on the wall. And then you have the musicians here, for instance, this uh, uh, individual who is blowing a trumpet. This is the sort of musical instrument that's still used in mullahs and religious festivals today in Egypt. So I look at this scene and I can hear the sound of that horn as it's being blown. And it's a, one of many examples of how ancient traditions are still very alive in Luxor, which makes it a very interesting place to live and to work. Now, because the southern part of the hall had only been finished in paint during the time of I, I'd again probably 
because of time constraints and involving his inauguration, his, uh, his uh, coronation. Uh, and af because after I's death, he simply appropriated the cartouches, but he didn't finish the carving. The carving was actually finished during the reign of Seti I. And what's interesting for art historians is that um, Seti finished the reliefs in the very low raised relief that was the stylized, stylistic hallmark of Tutankhamun, except for figures of himself that he does in a much higher relief that we associate with Seti. And those of you who are familiar with the reliefs of Seti I at Karnak and at Abydos in the Great Osiris Temple know that this is a very, this is a, the standard uh, style of very high rounded raised relief of Seti I. But here it's a combination, his own style with the style of Tutankhamun that his artists have imitated to make the, um, the reliefs very homogeneous. Now, one of the, in the process of recording these reliefs for publication, of course, we notice all kinds of details that are not immediately evident to the normal passerby. So in the case of this particular uh, set of reliefs, which are located here, at the very back of the colonnade hall, which was originally the front of the great solar court of Amenhotep III, um, there is a scene that shows Amenhotep III, very clearly uh, indicated here by his cartouches, facing a figure of the god Amun. And of course, Akhenaten attacked all of, the, all of the figures of the god Amun in Luxor Temple. He just blasted them away. He had a little problem with Amun. We still don't quite understand what his problem was, but at a certain point in his reign, he closed the temples of Amun. He hacked all the figures wherever they occurred and his names and destroyed Amun statues. So Tutankhamun presided over a restoration period where um, many statues were completely uh, recarved and restored, and his his craftsmen had to uh, recarve many of the figures that were blasted out of the walls. So, in all of the earlier parts of Luxor Temple, uh, previous to Akhenaten, all of the figures and and all the Amun temples in Luxor, the the uh, figures of the god Amun have all been smoothed back and recarved during a restoration period that began with Tutankhamun's reign. So it is probable that Tutankhamun was responsible for the restoration of the main sanctuaries of most of the temples uh, and sanctuaries in the Luxor area. And of course, this process was continued by his successors, I and Horemheb, and you have restoration that continues even into the Ramesid period. Now, another wonderful example of this is from Hatshepsut's mortuary temple at Dero Bahri, where in the main sanctuary, there was a representation on both sides of the great bark of Amun that during the beautiful feast of the valley was brought to Dero Bahri and set up in the bark sanctuary there. You have the head of Amun as a ram at the front and the back, and then a cabin here that's decorated with um, winged goddesses. You have the name of Horemheb here and also in the billow. Um, but what's interesting is while the carving is this beautiful light relief, um, there are these smoothed areas where you have uh, uh, Horemheb's name has been painted. And for instance, here, and in the billow and here, the original name um, was undoubtedly carved, just like the goddesses were, just like the other details. But they have the, the original name, probably Tutankhamun, has been smoothed back and um, painted over with the name of Horemheb. And uh, our Polish friends who've been working at Daryl Bahri, I believe, have actually found traces of Tutankhamun's name there. So it's pretty clear that this sanctuary. Uh, like many others, was restored during Tutankhamun's name. And then when his memory was suppressed later on, the, uh, the, uh, uh, his names were erased and replaced with, with Horemheb's in paint. 
Now, going back to the colonnade hall at Luxor Temple, you have to imagine that originally these columns were completely concealed from view by side walls that went as high as the columns all around. The, um, the side walls were all quarried away in the Middle Ages and the, uh, the blocks from the interior and the outside of the temple were reused uh, in building construction around the temple that in the, from the turn of the last century until the 50s and 60s was archeologically uh, cleared and quite a few of these fragments were recovered. When I joined the team uh, in the late 70s, I was fascinated by the fragmentary material and Bill Murnane actually gave me a handful of blocks to draw. It was one of my first tasks uh, uh, working for the epigraphic survey. So uh, one of the interesting things about drawing the fragments was I noticed that some of the fragments joined and I kept finding more and more and more joins. It turns out there was actually, there were actually hundreds of fragments in the block yard that reconstructed, that joined uh, from missing uh, wall sections of the colonnade hall and other parts of Luxor Temple. So in the colonnade hall, we have found hundreds and hundreds of fragments that originally came from the hall. Unfortunately, most of them float 20 or 30 or 40 feet in the air. But in this particular case, we had a very interesting situation where there is a section here of the outer wall of the colonnade hall that, it, that survived. We think that a house was built around it so it didn't get quarried away. But unfortunately, the inner part of that wall was quarried away and it was leaning in. So we were concerned that it might eventually fall in and it's a massive wall section. So providentially, we have a fragment group that joins the wall in front of this spur right here. And I showed you earlier a drawing of the barges of the queen and the goddess Moot. Um, directly above that, there's a fragment group that preserves another barge in the Opet uh, water procession. So here we have barge of the queen, uh, in this case, Tutankhamun's queen, Anxanamun, uh, uh, and two towboats helping to tow the barge of Amun's wife, the goddess Moot and up above a fragment group of 48 fragments that preserve towboats and part of the barge of the moon god Khonsu, the son of Amun and Mut. Um, you can see here, and we have the keel of the boat preserved on the wall, and this fragment group actually joins the wall at that point. So here was an opportunity to restore the fragment group and protect the wall at the same time. So utilizing the expertise of structural engineer Connor Power combined with uh, conservator Hiroko Korea, we planned the construction of a buttress, a stabilizing buttress made of brick, reinforced brick here on the inside of the wall. And you can see the buttress as it was completed here. This now preserves and protects and stabilizes the outer wall section. It cannot fall in, but it also acts as the backing for the restoration of a group of fragments. The upper part above the fragment group we um, lined with sandstone slabs that imitate the large blocks, uh, construction blocks of the hall. So you can see those in place here because we don't, you know, we want this to sort of fade into the background. We, we don't want the new restoration work to be like in your face. This is the area, the brick matrix um, onto which we were prepared, we prepared to uh, put the fragment group that joined the wall. And here we are laying the first of the blocks. And our stone cutter, Danny Roy, who supervised uh, and, uh, and executed the restoration of the blocks with our workman, Sabra and Ali here. Very carefully assembling the blocks as they originally 
appeared on the wall. And there are all kinds of clues and information preserved on the wall that gave us the exact location of all the fragments. We uh, inserted the blocks into this brick matrix so that in the future, when additional block, yard, block material is found, uh, if say I found a, this particular fragment or one of these fragments, we could actually dig out the brick and insert the, the sandstone block into its original place. So we we're constantly trying to think about future needs of the wall as well as the present needs. So here is the, the final um, or the undercoat plaster. And then we covered that with another layer of plaster on which I did restoration painting of the missing parts of the fragment group. Because from the ground, the floating fragments made no sense whatsoever. I knew what they were. And uh, some people, you know, some scholars might know what they were, but the general public would have no idea what those things were about. So just as we do very limited uh, restoration work, restoration drawing in our drawings to make fragmentary material comprehensible, we decided to do the same thing at the wall. And this is what it looks like today, where I've done very simple reconstruction showing the missing bits, but very simply to make it comprehensible from the ground. Text, running soldiers, uh, the towboats here, we have the backs of the towboats preserved. I've done no reconstruction drawing that I didn't know absolutely was there. And this is what it looks like from the ground with our restored um, slabs up here imitating the, the broken blocks, the restored fragment group here, and then the original um, uh, wall reliefs in situ. Now, in the analysis of the fragmentary material that went to the Colonnade Hall, we isolated all fragments, all blocks that were um, inscribed with Tutankhamun's names. And when we finished our sorting, we realized that we had a whole series, dozens and dozens of blocks inscribed for Tutankhamun that did not belong to the Colonnade Hall. This, this came as a total surprise to us. The style and iconography of the scenes was identical to the Colonnade Hall, uh, but the scale was different. <clears throat> uh, but the scenes were very, very similar. Bark procession scenes, offering scenes, texts, small-scale boat scenes, lots of cartesians of Tutankhamun in raised relief. The raised relief was stylistically identical to the Colonnade Hall scenes, um, but not from the Colonnade Hall. But there were some instances, some areas where you could see some earlier decoration, like here. This is, these are sunk relief offerings over which you have the, the raised relief to an uncommon relief. So what's going on here? Well, it turns out that the blocks, we realized the blocks were all Akhenaten Talatat. Uh, you could tell this by the size, 52 by 22 by 26 centimeters. Um, sometimes on opposite sides or adjacent sides, you had, actually had Akhenaten decoration, very different from the Tutankhamun decoration. You can see here sunk relief figures uh, running in the uh, a sort of exaggerated style of Akhenaten, very different from Tutankhamun. And in some cases, the Akhenaten decoration was upside down in relation to the Tutankhamun decoration. So this was not, we realized this was not an instance where Tutankhamun is actually adding to a monument of Akhenaten's. He is literally taking a monument of Akhenaten from Karnak completely down and reusing all the blocks in a completely different temple structure. So this is, this is an extraordinary discovery and a great gift. We actually had two for the price of one. We had an actually a, a completely different temple complex of Tutankhamun's in pieces in our blockyard. It got more interesting when we realized that the decoration on many of the blocks had a military theme, a battle theme. Some of them depicted parts of chariots, you can see horses' hooves here, chariot wheel, a running soldier. Um, 
chariots in full gallop with the, the Egyptian drivers here. You see the chariots with ranks and ranks overlapping chariots and charioteers. And they're not just in procession. This is clearly some sort of battle uh, that involving Asiatics, Northerners. You could tell by the beards and the bobbed hair and the square shields and all that we're dealing with uh, some sort of of uh, Asiatic battle here. It's just getting more and more interesting. And some really grisly details, like this poor Asiatic who's being dispatched uh, by one of the charioteers with a spear. And really wonderful carving, uh, stylistically ex extremely similar to the Colonnet Hall reliefs, but there are no battle scenes in the Colonnet Hall, and the Colonnet Hall certainly was not made of reused talata. The Style was matched by the text, and we were so lucky to have this one block that preserves a figure of Tutankhamun shooting a bow and arrow with his names preserved. They've been partly bashed. Uh, the photograph of this is very hard to read, so I'm just uh, showing you the, the drawing here. And it turns out this particular block, which has upside down Akhenaten decoration on the other side, relates to several of the other of the battle blocks and when you put them together this is what you get this is the block i just showed you and it goes with a large chariot with horses here uh, and then a whole series of subsidiary chariots underneath and behind the king so this is not just a battle scene, this is a really elaborate battle scene, the likes of which we have not seen before in Egyptian art. And it's actually much larger than that. We don't have a huge amount of material, but we have enough to know because of the proportions of the blocks that are all the same height and the same length, we're able to do a very provisional um, reconstruction of what this particular uh, battle uh, scene looked like. And it's very, very familiar for two reasons. One is that it's very similar to Ramesid battles that you find all over the temple walls from the time of Seti I, and Ramses II, and Ramses III. But this particular group featuring Tutankhamun is really similar to the painted chest found in Tutankhamun's tomb. So clearly we have a, a, a tradition here that is coming into flower during Tutankhamun's reign. Now, what's very interesting about this is this is one of several scenes, and I, I have to re, re, uh, remind you that all these blocks are small. They're all reused talatat of Akhenaten. We have another scene with the same types of blocks, the same Akhenaten Talatat recarved with raised relief battle scenes, again inscribed for uh, Tutankhamun, and with the battle theme that show what in traditional Ramesid battle narratives is after the battle, there's the presentation of prisoners to the king and booty in the case, in this case, uh, captured horses and chariots and all, and weapons. <clears throat> so you have at least two episodes here. So we were extremely interested in finding more of this material and finding out where it came from because all of the Talatat in the Luxor Temple blockyards came originally from Karnak, where they were in a reused concept, context the uh, later pylons that broke open and were quarried in the Middle Ages and the stone brought to Luxor Temple for uh, house and church and mosque construction in the Middle Ages. So going back to Karnak, we found many more of these blocks uh, that were reused Talatat of Akhenaten, recarved in the raised relief of Tutankhamun, lots of uh, cartouches and all. And we traced everything back to reuse context in the second pylon. Uh, this pylon uh, collapsed. It was com completely stuffed uh, this, uh, by Horemheb with earlier material. There was a palace of Hatshepsut. There are blocks of Amenhotep III, but there are also hundreds and hundreds of uh, Talatat of Akhenaten and also these raised relief 
of reused halitat of, of Akhenaten, a uh, structure of Tutankhamun's that was taken down and reused by Horemheb. These, uh, this pylon was quarried and the material went everywhere to the north as far as Metamu, to the south as far as Toad. Uh, it just walked all over the place. Someone made uh, a very good business out of selling this material in the Middle Ages and you, everywhere there are medieval uh, settlements you find this material uh, reused. Now also found in the second pylon was another temple from the time of Tutankhamun. But these were not small blocks, these were large blocks. And this is the, uh, these blocks have been known since the 50s when they were pulled out of the pylon by Henri Chevrier. And they show uh, uh, figures of Tutankhamun worshiping the god Amun. The, uh, the, the names of Tutankhamun are, are well preserved. Uh, in this particular case, they've been hacked. But the material, um, that survives that was that was partly removed from the second pylon is made up of uh, blocks that formed square pillars showing offering scenes of Tutankhamun and the gods and architraves that indicate that the structure was started by Tutankhamun not finished but it was finished by uh, his successor, I, who converted the temple into a memorial temple to the younger king. So there are uh, identical blocks that show uh, figures of I worshiping um, Amun as well as Tutankhamun. They're the same types of pillars. There are scenes showing statue dragging scenes of uh, statues of Tutankhamun from the royal, the royal cult. Uh, that are very similar to similar scenes found in a memorial temple to Thutmosis III that was constructed by, or, excuse me, to Thutmosis II that was uh, constructed by his son Thutmosis III on the West Bank. So it's a, it's a very interesting, we've got, we were extremely excited to find two sets of blocks, large blocks at Karnak, um, and small blocks at Luxor, we were all excited that we had like essentially two new temples um, that are from the time of Tutankhamun in addition to the, uh, the Colonnade Hall. Now, the blocks found at Karnak, the large blocks, um, wherever eyes cartouches occurred, they had been erased in preparation for the insertion, presumably, of Horemheb's name. Um, which is very interesting uh, by itself, because the implication is that up until a certain point in Horemheb's reign, Tutankhamun is still a good guy, and everyone wants to associate themselves with him. Uh, but then the program changed, and this particular temple and all the, the monuments of Tutankhamun all through Egypt were either taken down or the names were changed to those of Horemheb. So something happened during Horemheb's reign to cause a 180 degree shift in the official policy regarding Tutankhamun. There were dozens of architrave blocks like this found in the second pylon. Not all of them were removed, but quite a few. Our colleague, Mark Gabold, has been studying this material from the very beginning. He did his dissertation on the, um, the God's father, I, who became King I after uh, Tutankhamun's untimely death. And uh, all the, uh, the, the blocks are inscribed with I's names. They've been erased, but there are many, many traces that indicate it can be no one else but I. And here we've got Tutankhamun's cartouches as well. Now, of particular interest to me was there are large blocks showing battle scenes from this group, from the second pylon and the ninth pylon uh, that I uh, was very interested in as parallel material including this fantastic uh, block that shows a, the bar royal barge of the king, very similar to the royal barges depicted in the Colonnade Hall at Luxor Temple. But in this case, it has to be part of some sort of battle episode because you have a prisoner hanging from the yard arm in a cage. And here's a detail of this. This is 
pretty unique in Egyptian art. I do not know of another example. There's another block that, that has a detail uh, very similar to this from this group. But here you have an Asiatic bald with a beard, the Asiatic robes hanging from a cage from the, the, uh, the yard arm of the, of the king's royal barge. So extremely exciting material. The orientation of the large block battle scenes is the same as the small block battle scenes, and we began to be a little bit suspicious. Many of the blocks, um, again, battle scenes, mercenaries, these are all large blocks. There is even a group of large blocks that documented a Nubian battle scene. I don't have a good photograph of this block, so I'm showing you one of Mark Bold's uh, drawings of it here. But here you have Nubians being attacked. Again, you've got the king's chariot here uh, and the, um, uh, the Egyptian soldiers cutting off the, the hand of the the enemy dead as part of the tallying system, very gruesome. And here's another block showing another episode in the group where prisoners, Nubian prisoners are being presented by the king whose uh, uh, partly destroyed foot is here. These being presented to enthroned Amun, Mahmud, and Khonsu. And the details of the Nubian prisoners are absolutely fantastic. Remember the Nubian dancers in the Colonnade Hall? There's um, the, an attention to detail that just really sets this, this material uh, apart. Um, and uh, wonderful, unique details like a manacle here. In many cases, the, the, uh, the prisoners are bound, but in this case, the prisoner is bound with a manacle in the shape of a lion, which is extremely interesting and probably had a significance to them that we don't really understand today, but wonderful, wonderful details, very painful details, some of them. And again, um, Nubian soldiers, uh, excuse me, Nubian prisoners, mercenary soldiers, here you have an Asiatic mercenary, Egyptian soldiers, and once again, you've got this little guy who is blowing this horn that is still blown today during religious festivals. So just wonderful, wonderful details. Now, <clears throat> where the small block Asiatic battle narrative stops, the Tutankhamun in his chariot, with, surrounded by the Egyptian chariotry, the large blocks continue, and um, it looks like here we had a continuation of the same type of narrative where Asiatic prisoners are being presented to Amenemut and Khonsu by the, by the king. Now, we found no small blocks with any of these details, but they, they do survive in the form of large blocks. And Mark Abold and I began to realize that perhaps we did not have two separate monuments with the same sorts of relief decoration, but we had one monument that was made of two sizes of blocks. And then we found the Rosetta Stone of the Tutankhamun I monument. I, uh, up until a certain point, we had no small blocks inscribed for I, but we found a, um, a reworked a, a uh, reinscribed Akhenaten Talatat that has eyes, names that have been partly erased in preparation for the insertion of Horemheb's names and a cartouche of Tutankhamun. This is Neb Keperu Ra that's been partly hacked, but the name is very clear. So clearly we had a figure of I here who is worshiping a figure of the deceased Tutankhamun here. And this indicated that the small blocks and the large blocks came from the same monument. And uh, supporting evidence came when Mark realized that the large blocks from the Karnak group were actually cut down Akhenaten architraves from the Aten complex of Akhenaten at Karnak. So it's clear that all the small blocks were Talatat of Akhenaten, all the large blocks were architraves of Akhenaten, reused in a single monument started by Tutankhamun and finished by I after Tutankhamun's death. So that's what we were able to conclude. We had one 
one uh, temple complex made of reused material from uh, part of the Aten complex of Karnak. And the implication was that Tutankhamun started the demolition of the Aten complex at Karnak, which we did not know before. We knew that Horam had finished it, but we didn't realize that, Akna, that uh, Tutankhamun actually started that, that uh, process. Now, questions remain. What was the function of the Tutankhamun temple originally? Margabol believes that it was a sanctuary located at Karnak, in the Karnak precinct. Um, my suspicion, based on the, the iconography, the types of scenes, and the presence of the battle scenes, is that it was Tutankhamun's mortuary temple and uh, originally had a West Bank location. And when the temple was dismantled, it was brought back to the East Bank and used as the stuffing in the second pylon, which in the time of Hormheb had not been finished yet. So other questions are, is it possible that the reliefs actually depict a real historic event? Is it possible that Tutankhamun actually was leading the Egyptian chariotry forces at the very end of his reign? And do the blocks have any bearing on Tutankhamun's um, premature death? Here is the, the temple of Neb, Neb Kepru-Ra in Thebes, as it has been restored by Mark Bold, who has much more material uh, in the Karnak blockyards than the small amount that we have in Luxor. And it's pretty clear that you had a square pillared court uh, fronting a sanctuary area. And the battle scenes, it's pretty clear, ranged along the inside of this court. And this is something that you do find in mortuary temples, particularly in the late 18th dynasty, uh, you, and uh, of course the Ramesid material as well. So this, this is one, one indication to me that we're dealing with a mortuary temple. So pros and cons, arguments against it being a mortuary temple. It was reused in the second pylon on Karnak on the East Bank. Now, mortuary temples are always on the West Bank, so the blocks would have had to have been transferred across the river, which is fine. But because it was constructed of reused blocks from Akhenaten's Aten complex at Karnak, it meant that the blocks would have been quarried from the Aten complex at Karnak, taken across to the West, used in the monument there, and then uh, uh, when Hormeb dismantled it, brought back again to Karnak, which is a bit of a stretch, I will admit. But this material does tend to walk around. Now, the arguments for it, for it being a mortuary temple, we know that Kansu Temple at Karnak was constructed by Ramses III with blocks quarried from at least three mortuary temples from the West Bank, Amenhotep III's, Hormeb's, and the mortuary temple of Amenhotep, the uh, son of Hapu. So we know that material did cross the river. Um, it is interesting that the prescription of Tutankhamun and the dismantling of this particular structure must have happened late in Horemheb's reign because he had finished his own mortuary temple. None of these blocks were reused in that. So uh, it meant that, uh, that the Tutankhamun the Tutankhamun uh, I temple was still standing uh, until late in Horemheb's reign. And when he dismantled it, he brought it back across the river to uh, finish the construction of the second pylon, which was still unfinished. And as I said before, another reason that I believe that it was a mortuary temple is that the iconography of the scenes is more uh, appropriate to mortuary temples than uh, ju just a regular. Um, East Bank Temple. And one of the, one of the things, one of the, the reasons I have come to this conclusion is, uh, is in part based on this fantastic scene that survives in Ramses III's mortuary temple at Medina Tabu, this is the, uh, which is famous uh, throughout Egyptian art history. It is the great bull hunt scene of Ramses III. This has been considered by scholars to be one of the masterpieces of 
late ancient Egyptian art. And Groningen Frankfurt in particular, the, art, the famous art historian, believed that it was created by Ramses III and was, as she put it, the, the last gasp of originality in Egyptian art. It was just all copying afterward. And it is a masterpiece, there's no question. But what's very interesting is, among the blocks found of Tutankhamun found reused in the second pylon and the ninth pylon were blocks that show a very similar bull hunt scene. It's much smaller in scale, it's life size, but it's, it is exactly the same scene. And this suggests to me that the blocks that this, that the, the blocks of the structure uh, that the, these blocks came from must also have been a mortuary temple because you just aren't finding these types of scenes uh, in other temples. And what it means is that the great bull hunt scene of Ramses III is not original. It's the end point of a very long tradition that goes back even farther. And I've, I've identified a block, uh, a Talatet block of Akhenaten from Amarna that uh, reused at Hermopolis that may also show part of a bull hunt scene, which might come from the small Aten temple at Amarna um, that could very well have been considered to be the mortuary temple of Akhenaten at Amarna. So one has to be very careful in stating that anything is original to any particular time because ancient Egyptian art is constantly being uh, copied and reworked and reinterpreted over time. So do the battle reliefs depict real historic events? It's really hard to say. It is the earliest known episodic battle narrative in Egyptian art and the prototype of the great Ramesid battle narratives of Seti I, Ramses II, and Ramses III. There are battle-related scenes that go back to the beginning of, of chariotry warfare in Egypt at uh, Abydos, the temple complex of Amosis, for instance. Um, but nothing quite this elaborate with very distinct episodic scenes, one after the other in a very long narrative. There are unique details in the reliefs that are not repeated in other later battle narratives, which make one suggest, suggest to one that these reliefs actually document a real event in time. And we know from parallel contemporary material from the time of Tutankhamun that there was Egyptian military activity in Syria and Nubia uh, late in the reign of, uh, of uh, Tutankhamun. So some, some of the unparalleled details in the reliefs. On the left, you've got the king completely surrounded by the Egyptian chariotry. It's, this is, this is unique. We just do not have this earlier and we don't have it quite to that extent later even. But on the right are some of the more uh, interesting and macabre details that I have not found a parallel for in uh, any earlier or later battle scenes. And this shows the presentation of the severed hands of the, uh, the enemy dead, not just in piles in front of the king as they are shown in uh, the, the later Ramesid battle narratives, but they're strung on the spears of the shoulders like shish kebab, and the spears are being presented to the king. This is fantastic to tell, and it's, it's grisly nature. It makes you suspect the artist isn't just making this up, he's actually observing this. The other detail, of course, is the prisoner in the cage. I don't know of another parallel uh, for this. Um, so again, it, it makes, you, makes one suspect that the Egyptian artists are actually documenting uh, real events um, that occurred in real time. Now the parallel material in, uh, includes material from the Saqqara tomb of Tutankhamun's commander-in-chief, General Horemheb, who before he assumed the throne of Egypt, long after Tutankhamun's death, was uh, uh, served in the court of Tutankhamun, and uh, as I said, acted as his general. We are very, very fortunate that reliefs survive that show uh, 
a campaign or a series of campaigns that uh, General Horm have directed in Asia and Nubia, including blocks from the uh, putting together of a military camp, a campaign where tents are being erected. Uh, we've got tent poles and things being carried here. Uh, it's a great tragedy that more of these reliefs don't survive. The tomb was quarried uh, in uh, late antiquity, and so, we're, but we're very lucky to have even these details. There are scenes showing presentations of Asiatic and Nubian prisoners to, to the enthroned Tutankhamun and Aung San Amun. So we know that military exercises or military events occurred during Tutankhamun's reign involving the capturing of, um, of prisoners and booty. Here are some of the Nubian prisoners that are being presented to uh, Horemheb, who will present them to the king. Um, so, Conclusions. Historic? Very likely. Uh, there's a tendency in Egyptian art at this time, a carryover from the time of Akhenaten for truthfulness in artistic narrative. The unusual and immediate details of the fragmentary Tutankhamun battle narratives and the Hormeb tomb scenes are really striking for their originality. They're not the usual stock expressions of the king's ritual role as protector of Egypt, but are, seem to be observed details and probably true to life. That means that the presence of the king in these reliefs could indicate his real presence in the field. Now, Hittite sources mention Egyptian forays into Syria at this time, as Egypt and the Hittites struggle for control of the border strait states between them in the aftermath of Akhenaten's weak foreign policy. Uh, Horemheb as commander-in-chief of Tutankhamun would have led these missions, evidence for which can be seen in his tomb at Saqqara. It is distinctly possible that Tutankhamun accompanied him as he was approaching 20 about that time. But we know what happened. Tutankhamun died prematurely. Now, recent analysis of the mummy of Tutankhamun indicates death by trauma, broken leg, infection of the wound. A chariot accident is a likely culprit, possible cause. We know from his tomb equipment that the young king was an avid sportsman and hunter, but the accident which resulted in his death might actually have occurred on one of these military campaigns as, as, uh, uh, and been seen by the ancient Egyptians as a terrible, terrible omen for Egypt. In that case, the Egyptian sources would be completely silent as they are. From the evidence of her burial, we know that Horemheb's queen Mutnejmet died in childbirth in Horemheb's year 13, eliminating any possibility of an heir. After Horemheb's death in year 15, the kingship passed to the military family of Ramses I. For reasons of succession, Tutankhamun may simply have been discredited to eliminate any contenders to the throne associated with the old Thutmose line and his death by misadventure was used as the excuse. We had a very similar thing happening with Thutmosis III and Hatshepsut. Hatshepsut may very well have been discredited by Thutmosis III to ensure the smooth succession of his son, Amenhotep II. So what we know is that Horemheb was preparing to put his own name or placing I's name uh, with his own name in eyes erased cartouches in the Tutankhamun Eye Monument, thereby associating himself with Tutankhamun and the last of the Thutmosid line, continuing that line. But when Horemheb was obliged to adopt Ramses I as his heir, Tutankhamun was discredited, his monuments were dismantled, and everywhere they occurred, his names were erased and reinscribed for Horemheb. Tutankhamun, probably for political reasons, ceased to exist. Well, we all know that 3,300 years later, Tutankhamun came back to life with the discovery of his tomb in 1922. And he is now probably the most recognized pharaoh in Egyptian history. But we still know very little about his reign. As scholars reassemble the shattered fragments of his dismantled monuments, the accomplishments of this dynamic young king are slowly being revealed. 
Tutankhamun may have died too soon, but he left a growing legacy that will live forever. So stay tuned, new information is coming up all the time. Thank you very much for your time. And thank you, University of Memphis, Lorelei Corcoran, the Epigraphic Survey, the Oriental Institute, the University of Chicago, and, the, and especially the Egyptian Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities and the Supreme Council of Antiquities. Please be careful, everyone. Stay healthy, stay safe. Thank you. <laughs>